Mark chapter 4 and verse 1. We're kind of going slowly now. Think about We're talking about a conversation with a dead man. We said that if we have a conversation with a dead man, it's one-sided. We know from our studies last week that Ahab was not listening to God. God gave him mercy. God's a God of mercy, even though that mercy has its limits. Ahab crossed the line with God, but God in his mercy, remember, extended that deadline by three years, but, and God gave him better than what we would give someone else. But we closed lifetime saying this, don't mess with God, and Ahab died. But here's what I know today, and I, I believe this with all my heart, that some in this room are struggling to do what Jesus, we're going to read that he says. Chapter 4, verse 1, Mark says this, again, he, Jesus, began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in stories or parables, your translation says. And in his teaching he said to them, now Dr. Ronnie Smith was here in July, and he preached from this text from Luke's, Luke's account. Look at this next word, listen. Listen. Now, in that moment, thousands of people are around him, but there were only 12, I believe, that were honing in, Brother Jimmy, and actually could actually listen. And he told this story, didn't he, about this guy that had some seed. He went out to a big field. He sowed in different parts of the field. And, and then he ended it, and he said, if you'll look here in verse 9, and he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And our disciples of, of godly men that were studying on Saturday, we said this, if we don't have spiritual ears, the author said this, that we're a blockhead. That literally that we're not listening or hearing. The disciples couldn't understand what Jesus was saying, if you remember the story. And so they asked him, what does this mean? And I want to pick it up in verse 14, and here's what the Bible says. The sower sows the Word. Now that's God, the Word of God. And these are the ones along the path where the Word is sown, and when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the Word that is sown in them. Here's truth for us today. Some people can't listen. Now, when we go to Africa, you'll see this in the blog this week. When we go to Africa, they'll sit for an hour, and they won't even move when I'm teaching. They won't show you've been there. They don't they just sit there. They, they don't even move, and, but that doesn't mean that they're listening. Now, you go into our after-school care and our, our ministries here in our church. If you're a public school teacher, you know how to, you have teaching segments, don't you? Because you just don't know if they're listening or not. So here, listen, some people can't listen. Jesus went on and said, there are those also that were sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy, and they have, but they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Here's someone who, who said they had listened, but they didn't. I've been guilty. Anyone else in the house? I've been guilty. Sure, he said, hey, uh, you know, do this. And I'm like, I get out there and I buy the wrong thing and I come home and it's so evident that I was not listening. So can I pause this moment and say, there's some people who say they're listening to God and are not. Where are you today? Then there's thirdly, it says this, and others in verse 18 were sown among thorns. <clears throat> These are those who hear the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfaithful. Some people can't hear. Some people say they hear and they don't. And some people somewhat hear. There's some people that, that kind of hear, but maybe they, they make a change or two for a few days or a few months, and, but then all of a sudden, the things around them, because they kind of, and they said they did, and somewhat, but they really hadn't, they not severed themselves from the roots that were already in their lives, and so they go right back to where they were. So let me ask you, what are you listening to this morning? And then the Bible says, but there are those who are sown on the good soil and the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. There's some people who, 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 say, who say I hear and they don't. There's some people who somewhat hear. There are those who can hear. And then there are those that God opens by the grace of God to hear and they get saved. Amen? And when you get saved, the voice of the Lord becomes powerful. It's majestic. And some of us, we serve the Lord with 30-fold. Some of us with 60-fold. Some of us just dive all the way in and say, God, use every ounce of talent and gifting that you've given me in my life. So if you can hear this morning, how much are you leaning in to hear? 
So with that said, go back with me now, back to where you were in chapter number 21 and verse 51. There, there is this man, Ahab, who has died, and his son, and verse 51, comes to the throne. Here it says, chapter, chapter 22 and verse 51, notice this, Azaziah, the H is silent, Azaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned, notice this, two years over Israel. If we were to bring this man to the platform today, and so as is I, or as a Zai, we how how are you hearing and what are you hearing? I wonder what he would have said. Two things I know about them as they come before you in a moment. I wrote this down. Azaziah was a spiritual man, dead man, who'd been blessed to be given the opportunity to be a king of a nation. For two years, this man led, but before that, we don't know actually his age, but he was raised in his mom and dad's house. Now listen to me, the prophet Elijah visited his daddy. One of the greatest blessings that I had as a young man was that when, when a preacher would come, an evangelist to our church, guess where they would eat the evening meal? At my house. Not only that, through the years, ever back in the day, we used to have all kinds of revivals. We don't do them that much anymore. All the great preachers that we would have at the churches that I've been a part of, I'd always have them to our house so that our kids could hear and be ministered to by what people do. I, we take our students around the world because we want them to hear. But let me say this to you. If you are spiritually dead, no matter what's presented to you, you can't listen. Now hang on to that for a moment. Now the Bible says here, notice in verse 52, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Why? Because he walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. Now notice, he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger in every way that his father had done. Look this way for a moment. He listened to his daddy and his mama. Here's a question. If your children or your grandchildren or your friends or your spouse or people that you have influenced, if they listened and did everything that you said, what kind of people would they be? Someone said this, that, and it's kind of amazing, if we are left to ourselves, things go from bad to worse. Now, you need to know this. The people that live with you and work with you, that they are looking at you as to who you are, and they are always listening to you. You see, Ahab had led his son to follow in his footsteps. The second thing that I know about him was this, that he was a spiritually unwise man. Because he didn't have to be like his daddy. And some of us today are, go, go, to, go to psychiatrists and psychologists and, and they take us all the way back to our parents, don't they? They take us all the way back to our beginning and there, there, there's validity there if things went astray. But many of us are blaming our mom and dad for a decision that we, they didn't have, we didn't have to make. You see, you don't have to be blind to God, and you don't have to live like the world. Listen to me. One of the early kings of Israel by the name of Solomon, when he got older, wrote a book called Ecclesiastes under the anointing of the Spirit of God. And listen to what he said in Ecclesiastes 8, 1 and 2. It's going to be for you on the screen. How wonderful to be wise, to analyze and interpret things. Wisdom lights up a person's face. And listen, it's softening its harshest question. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? When you as an individual are in the community, what do you see? I, I, I don't know about you, but I can tell, Brother David, when I go in a place, what, what the mood is by the people that when I look at them. I mean, I can tell at a restaurant. I, I, I can tell when I go to, go to a church. I, I've been to the first frozen church. Anybody else? I've preached in places like, by the time the servant, like, God, get me out of here alive. May, the, may what they have not touched me, dear Lord, tonight. But then God humbled me and told me that I should speak in a godly way. We, we read on. It's not in your notes, but, but hear the word of the Lord from Ecclesiastes 8. Obey the king because you vowed you would. Don't try to avoid doing your duty. Don't stand with those who plot evil, for the king can do whatever he wants. So Solomon said, you better obey the king. Listen to verse 5. Those who are wise will find a time and a way to do what's right. Verse 7 says this, Indeed, how can people avoid what they don't know is going to happen? He goes on to say this, None of us can hold back our spirit from departing. 
In other words, we're all going to die. None of us have the power to prevent the day of our death. There's no escaping the obligation, that dark battle. And in the face of death, wickedness will certainly not rescue the wicked. So remember, Ahab had 20 plus years, 22 years to get it right. He didn't, but this man's only going to be given two. So don't assume to me today that in America, because we've had over 200 years of history, that we're going to continue on and God's going to be merciful right on. Eventually, payday's coming. And so if you look with me in your Bible, chap, second, excuse me now, in, all the way over, we've gone to 2 Kings now, and chapter number 1 and verse 1. After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. And Azariah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria, and he lay sick. Now, just quickly, I'm going to present to you four different little scenes and come back and ask you one question, only one, and here's the question, what did you hear? That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to walk through these simple little scenes in the text of, as the Word of God gives it. Number one is this. Here we see an accident that literally might be more than an accident. I, I did the research, like, what kind of lattice was it that he might have fallen through? Where was he? Mo most believe that the Hebrew word here for lattice is, is actually either a balcony or a window. A anybody ever, ever slip and fall? Don't lie to me. I watch people all the time. How many times have you encountered an accident and you blame someone else? The Bible says, write this reference down, Micah 2 and 2, or excuse me, Malachi 2 and 2. If you will not listen, God says, if you will not take to heart and give honor to my name, says the Lord, then I will send a curse upon you. Here this man was, was the king of a nation. And listen to this, in a moment, Proverbs 16, 18 comes to be his story. Pride goes before destruction, and listen to this, an arrogant spirit before a fall. Here this man on the top of the nation of the world slips and falls. I don't know how, but he falls down and he hurts himself so severely that it's life-threatening. Have you ever found yourself in a difficult place and just wondered if this is more than an accident? I mean, look, look at America and what we've been through in, in the past few weeks. Could it be that, that Almighty God is doing something and it's not just nature? Could it be that, that in your journey, in your past to this moment, that God and His love and His mercy is trying to bring you to a place that you might hear and learn from His teaching? I find this all the time for people that when things happen, they, they give them to an accident when actually it may be something more than that. So, so here's what the Bible says. Notice this. So he sent messengers in verse, verse 1. Excuse me, verse 2. Telling them, go, inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Elkron, wherever I will I recover from this sickness or not. Now, you say, well, that's just what they did. Well, think about this for a moment. There are moments that there's an accident that might be more than an accident. Secondly, here we see an assignment. Now watch this. That is more than an assignment. Have you ever gotten yourself into something? You thought, man, I probably shouldn't have done that. Got hooked up with some people. Got hooked up in a job. Got hooked up in a process. Got hooked up in an organization. Just, just got in something. Made a commitment to something. And then all of a sudden you realize what was going on. What is going on here? And listen to me. Write this reference down. We, Luke chapter 11, verses 14 through 23. In Luke 11, Jesus heals as he often did. And it heals this person who is demon-possessed. And as he healed that person, Frank, listen to me. There are those in the crowd who did not believe he was the Son of God. Now, hear the word of the Lord. They said this to them. This man casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Now, now listen to this now. While others were testing him, saying, say, give me a sign. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a divided household falls. Here is the deal that maybe you may not get. Look, just look on this screen right here. There was an assignment that was more than an assignment. Listen to me. This king said, I want you to go to Elkron. There they worship Beelzebub. You know what he was doing? He was assigning them to go to the devil and ask him what he thought. Anybody with me yet? 
We in America have become, I, 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 I don't know if I should use this or not. Forgive me if this is offensive to you in a sinful way for me, but I hope it's a godly way. We as Americans today have been so dumbed down that we're going to the devil and asking his opinion when there's the King of kings and Lord of lords that we never even consult. You say, Pastor, I, I'm not following you. How many of you have taken a job that you, were, you thought, boy, this was God's assignment for me, but since you've taken it, you've not been in your Bible one time? Since you've taken it, you're less with your family than you've ever been before. You're making more money than you've ever made, but you're more miserable than you've ever been in your life. You see, listen to me. Sometimes we think that we're hearing God and we could be hearing the devil. There are times that, that, that I, I was thinking through this, that there are times that, that, that we say this, I just need to feel something. Do you know that that is the secular viewpoint of our day? Friends, I don't need to feel something when the house is shaking. I need to be on a solid foundation. I don't need to feel something when my life's falling apart. What I need to do is have something to stand on, which is the Word of God. We live in a day of a weightless God, one author said. You mean, you say, what do you mean a weightless God? We live in a day where that people today, now watch this, they systematically began to tear down God's Word. Here's where it started. They started saying this, that, that the miracles are not God's Word. They began, in our seminaries, they began to say it. And there's denominations that, that watched. They started there, and so what they're saying is this, that not all the Bible was the Word of God. So they took away the miraculous. And so the next thing that you know, they said, the God of the Old Testament, I, I'm going to do a direct quote, a direct quote from Andy Stanley who said this, that you have, to, you have to distance yourself from the Old Testament to follow the God of the New Testament. Because the, the, here's what they believe. They believe this, that God in the day of Noah was like a child who was upset and didn't get his way, so he caused the flood to come upon the earth. But now in the New Testament, as we preach the God of mercy and the God of grace, that God matured. You say, preacher, are you crazy? That's what's being taught in denominations in this very city that I stand in. Now you hear me. And so what ended up happening, they took away the miraculous, and then we took away the miraculous. Now they start to say that God has changed, and so that, that means this. Hear me now, that we now can change the Bible. Now that's not what we believe. We believe the Word of God is timeless. But around us, there are people who are teaching that, and so here's what they do. God has matured, and because God has matured, that we have to change His Word to, to meet that, so we can say such things that, as homosexuality is, is, listen, is, is of God. Now listen to what one Methodist preacher, who oh, I could give you the exact quote for who said this, not in our city, but in California. He said this, he believed that as long as a person does not have sex with a child, it doesn't matter who or what they have it with, as long as it's not a child. Now, you hear me now, y'all getting all upset and cranked up. But listen to me. We have sat in churches for years because we have made God weightless. He is the same God in the day of Elijah that He is today. He's the same God. And some of you will send me emails and things. Please send that to me, Pastor Keith at JacksonFBC.com. I want to be able to help you in your walk with God. Notice verse 3. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, now, notice here, Brother Michael, I, I, in, your, I, in your research, if you got this or not, he said, the angel of the Lord. I believe this is a pre-incarnate vision of Christ in the Old Testament. A theophany of God. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise and go to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, it is, because there's, is there because there's no God? In Israel, that you're going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Elkhorn. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, you shall not come down from your bed to which you've gone up, but you shall surely die. Now, friend, when you cross the line with God, you're ended even while you're walking. When Jesus gave this parable, Jesus, some people can't hear. Other people say they're hearing, but they're not. Some people somewhat hear, but it's revealed in the end that their roots are somewhere else, and they're not. So just can I preface the final question? Uh, what, what, are, what, are you hear, what are you hearing? You see, there's this man who's unwise and spiritually dead. There was an accident that was more than an accident. There was an assignment that was more than an assignment. But thirdly, there's an answer that's more than an answer. 
You see, he wanted him to go down, and, and he wanted him to go down and to ask the devil what, what was happening. But the man of God was coming, and he ran into the messengers, and he said, hey, I want you to go and tell the king there is a God in Israel, and boy, you are going to die. So, so let me ask you this. How do we respond in a day of struggle? How do we respond in this day? We know the Bible says this in Hebrews 9, 27. It's once point for every person to die, and after that comes the judgment. Ecclesiastes 8 and 8, no man has the power to retain the spirit or the power over the day of his death. Job 14, 5, God says this, I've appointed your limits and you will not pass. But how many people hear that and just keep on what they're doing? And how many of you have gotten so used to hearing the pushback that you've grown weary of pushing back against the pushback? Now, notice what the Bible says in verse 5. The messengers returned to the king, and he said to them, Why have you returned? And they said to him, There came a man to meet us and said to us, Go back to the king who sent you and say to him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Elkron? Therefore you shall not come down from your bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. He said to them, Now notice this, What kind of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? Now, the first thing that I would have said, if it was like, when did he say I was going to die? Anybody else? If the doctor says, son, you have cancer, I'm not going to say, now in nine months from now, I'm going to address this. But notice what the Bible says. They answered him. He wore a garment of hair and with a belt and leather about his waist, and he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. He said nothing about his death. You see, here it is. There's this answer that he gives back to the man of God that's more than an answer. Let me say it again. He is saying that, God, you are weightless. Elijah, the man of God, was going to go because God, he didn't argue, he just went. And this morning, I must tell you that I did not have the joy getting up here and having to say these things. It's a shame to have to say these things. The people who get behind a sacred desk and people who sit in a sacred seat on Sunday in America and lie and cheat and steal and do wrong in the name of God. But I'm telling you, there's good news. The good news is the gospel is going forth. You remember the disciples once they got all fired up at Jesus and said, said Jesus, do you want us to call fire down from heaven? You're like, what do you mean? And Jesus said, no, 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 no. The judgment's coming, but right now, proclaim the gospel. Which leads me to this. We see, see the king's authority versus God's authority. The Bible says, then the king, in verse 9, sent to him a captain of 50, with his 50. He went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of the hill, and said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. Now, this is not what, how I just read it. This guy comes according to the Hebrew text, the original text. He comes and he's, he's arrogant. He's mad. He says, the king says, you come down. Now I want you to follow this. Listen to me. But Elijah answered the captain of 50, if I am a man of God, it's about to happen. Let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Are y'all with me here? An accident was not an accident. Now listen to it, it was not. Listen to me. An assignment was more than an assignment, and the answer was more than an answer. And now in this moment, the authority of God was challenged by the authority of the devil. And God says, since you're on the devil's side, this is what's coming. Again, the king sent to him another captain of 50 men uh, with his 50, and he answered and said to him, O oh, man of God, this is the king's order. Come down quickly. I am told by those who study the Scripture deeper, far deeper than I can, that in the Hebrew it's even stronger. He's mad. He's upset. And, but Elijah responds, I believe, in a calm way. If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. So now a hundred men have died because a spiritually dead man who's unwise stands against God. Since 1974, brothers and sisters, 
How many are the numbers that have died because of spiritually dead and unwise people in America that we voted for and we stood for? How many of our generation and the previous generation, hear me, are now living a life apart from God because they do not have fear and reverence and love for Him? You see, I, I know this with all my heart, that what you believe in and practice your children, if they believe in you, will believe in what you believe in and what you practice. I love you today, but I want to tell you something. You and I have a responsibility for what our kids are doing. Now, if they turn against God and you've walked with God and they're shaking their fist at God, that they're, they're on their own foundation. I understand that. But I often am gut-checking my own life I have actually stood with my own kids one-on-one -on -one and collectively and said to them, if there's anything in my life that's been inconsistent with my adult kids, if there's been anything inconsistent in my life to the gospel, would you please forgive me because I've asked God to forgive me? I want to tell you, I don't know why I'm going this way in this service because it's not exactly how God had put this in the Word, in this text, but this is where God's led my heart to today. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says this in verse 13, and the king sent the captain of a third party with 50, and the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on the knees before Elijah and entreated him, O oh man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. You see, not everybody in this world is wicked. Some people are listening through the airways, through your example. There are many people who are listening. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the two former captains of the 50 men with their 50s. But now let my life be precious in your sight. Question, who's precious in your sight? When I sit with our young adults on Sunday night, it's because I believe they're precious in God's sight. When we have this after-school care, it's because we believe that they're precious in the sight. When we, when we work with our children and adults and senior adults, we believe that they're precious in God's sight. And you know what happened? The man of God gave him grace. And I want to tell you today, if someone that shakes their fist at God and says that God will not, God will not accept me as I am, they're right. But He will accept them when they repent and follow Jesus. Look, look on the screen at what Jesus said. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, now notice this, I will never what? For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will. Now listen to this, but the will of him who sent me. Let's read the next verse. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son, now here it is, here, here it is, and believes in him. You see, if you don't listen, you can't believe. When was the last time that you sat down with an open Bible and said, God, help me to listen. Help me to listen. Elijah went and met with Azaziah. And he told him what the Lord said. And he, the last words he said to him, and you will die. And you know what the Bible says? He died. Where will people go when they die? Heaven or hell? The God that they will stand before will not be a weightless God. He's a God of love and mercy and grace, but justice and wrath. So what can you do? Well, listen to this. Notice it on the screen. There are many people, many people who need to change leaders, don't they? If that's you today, I'm out of time. Oh, I wish I had 20 more minutes with you. I wish that I had 20 more minutes to say to you that that is the answer to your problem. If you can't hear, Jesus will come and crush that obstruction in your life. If you're rocky in your life right now, God will come and listen to you. He will throw the rocks out of your life. If you are in your life now that there are all these thorns and you're, you're down, your roots are and other things that are taking the preeminence over God, He'll cut those roots and He will do this in John 15. He is the vine and we are the branches. So come to Jesus in this very moment. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you will reach out to us at info at jacksonfbc.com with your questions. And check out more of our ministries at jacksonfbc.com.